I'm Julie Pace, Washington Bureau Chief for the Associated Press, and this is Ground Game. The coronavirus pandemic ranks among one of the most consequential stories ever covered by the Associated Press in its 170-year history. Here to take you inside the outbreak is AP's Ralph Russo. From the Associated Press, this is Inside the Outbreak. I'm Ralph Russo. Today is Thursday, May 21st. In New Jersey, state officials have launched a website to debunk rumors and hoaxes associated with the spread of the coronavirus. That came after a false text message of an impending national lockdown that circulated widely across the United States. Similar actions are underway in other states to knock down potentially harmful misinformation. Today on Inside the Outbreak, we'll talk about different kinds of made-up pandemic stories. Halel Atali, a longtime AP national writer who covers books and arts, joins us to discuss how pandemics often inspire art. We talked about books and movies, all sorts of stories that used pandemics to drive their plots, some going back centuries, others that might have felt like science fiction at the time they were released. We're learning now that movies such as Contagion and Outbreak weren't totally far-fetched. Halel Atali is a national writer for the AP. Thanks for joining me today to talk about plagues and art. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you for having me. How far can we look back and find art of various kinds inspired by widespread deadly sickness? We get, I mean, we get at the very least, you go back to ancient Greece, where it's famously described in the, um, the history of uh, Thucydides, the Greek historian, who describes a plague uh, during the Peloponnesian War. And I mention it because it, in many ways, the way he described it, you can still talk about it now. There's nothing supernatural about it. He doesn't look at it as some kind of divine uh, punishment. He, it's just something that happens. And, and something else about it is it's a very, very grim view of humanity. He's basically saying, here comes this plague, all kinds of terrible things happen. And, and there's no great redeeming uh, message out of it. People behave badly, people suffered, and do not look at this as, you know, don't look for redemption here. Don't look for a silver lining here. So a very distinctive way of looking at it. And I mention it because if you look at plagues and how they're depicted over time, it's very often fits into how somebody sees the world. You can fit it to a point of view. You can tell it as a morality tale, uh, for instance, in, in any number of ways. Um, whether it is about what people are capable of doing under duress. One of the great examples is the short story by Edgar Allan Poe, The Mask of the Red Death, where you have a, a country where plague has devastated a great deal of the population, but inside this abbey, inside this uh, you know isolated area, you have the prince, Prince Prospero, who he's fine. I mean, he just he kind of considers himself invincible because um, he views it almost like as a, um, like an invading army. He sees, well, here I am behind these great walls and I have guards, nothing can touch me. And he throws this great party um, and, and a revelry. And um, basically what happens is a visitor comes, the visitor basically being the plague, being death and ends up is everybody dies. And um, it's sort of a great example. And it's something you can look at today of people today who think they're invincible. Can't happen to me. Maybe they think they can, you know, their mansion will protect them. Or people who are young and, and healthy and think nothing can happen to them. So um, this becomes kind of a metaphor for people who think, you know, that they're invulnerable. Uh, and it very much is relevant today. Why do you think it's been, you mentioned a little bit of this, it's sort of, it's a, it's a storyline that can sort of transcend. Why do you think it has remained such a compelling instrument for storytellers? Well, I mean, the plague, any, any plague is something that puts us 
in such an extreme situation where aspects of human nature come out that maybe you would never see otherwise, and also revealing sort of the vul our vulnerability very much about that. You look at something, this is something Steven Soderbergh said when he made a, a contagion, you know, about a, this terrible plague, that part of what he wanted to do was say, look how vulnerable we are. We think the way we live now in modern society is sort of just how it is and that, and that our foundations are strong, but, but look what can happen to them. Look how they can be torn apart. So I think for any creative person, one of the one of the sort of cores of creativity is what makes us tick. What are we really all about? And plagues can be a way. We we can sort of go through um, our life with sort of what you might say a veneer. Uh, you know, civilization. Some people would say it's just a veneer as long as we as long as we're fed and housed. Uh, we can behave in a in a dignified way, but what happens if all of that is threatened? What if, what if that's taken away from us? And then, and then we find out what we're really all about. So I think that's something that really uh, uh, draws artists to that. You mentioned in your first answer that one of the compelling things of looking back on sort of the representation of outbreaks and plagues through history is that they, they don't necessarily have a science fiction-y feel toward them, though I imagine, I, want, I wonder if there has been some evolution of how they are represented, especially when you get into the more modern era when you have science fiction and things along those lines. Well, I mean, depictions of plague often, they'll try to be realistic about it as they can if you look at something like Contagion. You could call it science fiction because it's speculative, because some of the aspects that are shown in there are, um, you know, based on science. But there's also a great deal of realism. You know, they will research that and say, how would this work? You know, what, what happens to the body when a given virus at attacks it? What happens to our institutions when they get challenged to the point that they can't uh, handle it anymore. Now, there's a book just out called uh, The End of October by Lawrence Wright, known as a, a journalist, uh, but he's also a novelist. And this is about a pandemic. Uh, he had started this well before the current pandemic. But uh, the way these things happen is because plagues, uh, this is not the first plague. It's not the first time that anyone's thought about a pandemic. You had someone, you know, even before now, people looking into it and saying, what if, what if this, and his actually originates in Asia, as, as uh, the current one apparently does. And he really based it on, you know, he did journalism. He went out and, and he did his research and you, you talk to scientists about it and you sort of explore, well, okay, how would a virus go from A to B to C? What would happen if, say, you know, this many people were infected, what, and this many people died? What would the government do? And so realism in science is, is very important, uh, even in science fiction. It, it's, it's important that it, it rings true, even if it's something that supposedly has, has not happened, that it's imagined. Uh, realism is, is, is very important uh, in stories like this. So I think it's fair to say that we will have lots of books written about what we are currently going through, nonfiction books chronicling the history, journalism, and also fiction that, that will come of this, people who will weave this into their storytelling. Are, are, there, are there some examples of previous public health crises, pandemics, plagues, outbreaks that, that have spawned great work? So there are examples of great work that are sort of milestones to that particular crisis. Well, I think that one one uh, milestone, a work that people point to, is a, a story by Catherine Ann Porter, a great fiction writer in the 20th century, who wrote something called Pale Horse, Pale Rider, which was based on uh, the epidemic that people talk about the most now, the flu epidemic of 1918 and 19. And, and, and she wrote a, a short novel based on that. And um, she was really looking at it as not just because she wanted to describe the, what happens with an epidemic, but it was also the end of World War One. 
and she was uh, kind of writing it as well as kind of a, a parable of of war. And uh, what one scholar I spoke to called it a spiritual malaise, combined um, a really truly horrifying epidemic like the flu, along with all of the deaths of World War One. And, and you're really telling a story of a, you know of a terrible time in history. And uh, and she also when she wrote the book, she didn't write it immediately uh, after. It was written in the 1930s when there was a fear again that war was going to begin again. So there was a terrible feeling of you know foreboding. So there would be a case of someone who you know genuinely made. Uh, memorable art, you would call it, uh, out of a pandemic. And it's also interesting, as you said, in some cases, I, I mean, from reading your story, artists, authors, writers might use a pandemic as a metaphor for some other problem, some other crisis, but using the pandemic uh, as sort of the backdrop or again, as a metaphor for it. Oh, sure. Um, you know, uh, you have Stephen King famously who writes The Stand, and I think his concern there was sort of, you know, bio-warfare, military research. What happens when, you know, you lose control of that? You know, that gets out of hand. So, yes. You know, again, one of the things that about plague, and this was that the same similar when September 11th happened, um, I remember very quickly the differing interpretations of September 11th, the metaphors that were drawn for it. There were people who thought September 11th was a symbol of American weakness. We let our guard down. And then there were people who said, no, you know, September 11th is what happens because it was chickens come home to roost. Look what we had done in countries around the world. So very quickly, you had people sort of interpreting September 11th often in a way that sort of kind of reinforced what how they already felt. And so um, you take something again, going back to Thucydides. Thucydides is one of the great pessimists of history. He had a very, very grim view of human nature. Uh, he basically thought, you know, that all, only power mattered, morality was meaningless. And so a plague for him becomes a way of just, showing, yes, this is true. What happens when there's a plague? Well, people are at each other's throats. The strong survive, the weak suffer. And, you know, please don't look for a, get a, some kind of story of beauty and redemption out of this. So, um, yes, very much. And and you could say, too, with Poe and, and the Mask of the Red Death, you know, he's saying that, look, you can't, death disease is unstoppable. Uh, you know, very kind of grim, gothic view, realistic, you could also say. And so people who pretend otherwise, um, you know, are, are, are doomed to find out how, how foolish they were. You spoke about Lawrence Wright's book soon to come out. And, and in your story, you mentioned a few other writers who are uh, somewhat coincidentally have books coming out that have a plague or, or an outbreak as a backdrop. Give us a little insight as to some of those books, and and do you do you anticipate them being more popular now? That's a great question about more popular. The, if you look at the bestseller lists right now, there aren't a lot of plague books on them. In some ways, it's a mix of usual things like Michelle Obama's memoir. There's also right now the big selling books. A lot of them are children's like workbooks because you have so many parents at home who need um, activities uh, for their children. It's sort of a debate. I mean, there are people who seek it out, like a lot of people have sought out Albert uh, Camus' The Plague, which has been taken as sort of a metaphor for the Nazis because it was it was written around the time of um, World War II. Uh, but there's also a great deal of escapism as well. So it, it, it's hard to measure. Some people really want to dive into it. There are people who've gone back and read histories, say, of the, of the uh, flu epidemic of 100 years ago. And there are others who just want to read, you know, mystery novels. Um, now, as far as uh, books uh, with plagues in it, there's a book called Afterland by uh, Lauren Bukes. Now, this was a case, again, of somebody who had an idea. She wanted to sort of tell a story that, that sort of explored issues of gender. And so she comes up with um, a story in which you have a, a pandemic and the people who are being killed by it are the men. 
And so her exploration of well, what happens if you have a pandemic that affects essentially the men and the women are spared from it. So it's a case, again, of somebody using a, a storyline like this for something else. You know, they, they have ideas that they bring to the world already. And so they're looking at something like a pandemic as a way of, well, how can I sort of show this maybe in a particularly dramatic and uh, explicit kind of way? Halal Atali is a national writer for the AP. Thank you for joining me today, Halal, to talk about sort of the intersection of the outbreak and art and how it has uh, sort of evolved through history. Appreciate your time. Thank you for the insight. And please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and stay safe also. At APnews.com, today's One Good Thing feature is a story about a temple in India. The Bangla Sahib Gudwara in New Delhi has served millions of people simple vegetarian food in its enormous dining hall. But during India's coronavirus lockdown, religious congregations are banned. About four dozen men have kept the temple's kitchen open, cooking up to 100,000 meals a day. The local government is distributing the meals at shelters and drop-off points throughout the city. You can read that story in all of AP's coronavirus outbreak coverage at apnews.com. That's it for this episode of Ground Game. We'll be here every step of the way during this extraordinary moment in American politics and American life, giving you all the news you need to know. Be sure to tell a friend about us, and please subscribe on Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Some of the details of our discussion may have changed by the time you hear this. For up-to-date developments on all of your news, head over to apnews.com. From the Westwood One Podcast Network. 